For part two of my talk, I want to concentrate on the subject of confession. Our reading today is basically all confession, including that bit in the middle that was cut out in what was read out today. 38 verses of rehearsing what had gone wrong. Doesn't sound like much fun, does it? You know, is it even healthy? Shouldn't we be practicing self-affirmation? And shouldn't we be loving ourselves so that we can love others? Well, hopefully you won't be surprised to hear that I'm going to say that I think it is healthy. Um, in fact, I think that the act of confession is vital even for our spiritual growth with God, if we do it right. And there are a few points I'd like to pull out of our text from today to help illustrate how confession goes. Firstly, it's interesting to note the timing of the confession in our story. Tim pointed out last week that as Ezra began to read the law to the Israelites, they began to mourn and weep. And at that point, they were ordered not to. They were ordered to celebrate. They accepted joy as a gift from God at this point where the wall had been built and the temple was restored. In fact, they celebrated the Te Feast of Tabernacles in their temporary shelters for seven full days of feasting. And it tells us at the end of chapter 8 that their joy was very great. But then on the eighth day, we reached the beginning of chapter 9, and it was time to mourn. And the Israelites knew how to mourn properly. They expressed the disposition of their hearts through the clothes they wear, their eating habits, even their personal hygiene. There's a lesson for us here about experiencing our spirituality as embodied beings. But that's a teaching for another time. Having studied God's word and enjoyed his goodness for a full week, it was clear to everyone in the assembly how much they had failed. See, confession isn't a sort of maudlin show of self-pity or even self-hatred. Confession is the natural effect of self-reflection in the presence of a holy God. Confession is a close neighbour to joy in our worship, because at that moment where we comprehend how little we deserve, we also see how much God has done for us, and all for free. He has graciously given us so much, and blessed us anyway, and he will forgive us the moment we truly turn and ask. And this is always the pattern of things. God's grace precedes our repentance. There is nothing we can do to earn his forgiveness. But instead we receive the free offer of forgiveness because of the great love he's already shown us. And you'll notice in the story of the Jews here, God didn't wait until they confessed properly before allowing them to return from exile, before allowing them to rebuild the temple and the wall. In fact, God restored them to their nation. God restored them to worship and safety. And then they realised and confessed. The sequence was backwards to what we might expect. Now this sort of confession was clearly a, a special event within the narrative of our story. But it should not be limited in our lives to a one-off, life-changing moment. If, like me, you follow Jesus, then hopefully you've had at least one moment like this, at that point where you turned to God and asked for his salvation. But the expectation of the New Testament is that this is not a just-once experience. The Apostle John teaches us that we all sin and fall short of God's glory. And he says that we must continue to confess our sins in order to continue to receive forgiveness and to be purified. The Apostle James likewise tells us to confess our sins in order to receive healing. Now in the Protestant tradition we've largely turned away from the tradition of um, confessing or the discipline of confessing our sins to a priest. But James in particular instructs us that we should be confessing our sins to one another. Now we need to take care in choosing the right person. Somebody we can trust somebody who is able to take the emotional weight of our confession. But confessing to the right person can be a truly powerful event in our lives. 
And it releases a power that is more even than that silent confession that hopefully we frequently do before God. God has created us as social beings. And there is a social power that is built into the way, we are, the way we are made, that the trust and openness of accountability releases a force in our lives to help us to transform, to grow in character, and to grow in spiritual maturity. Now before I sort of conclude part two of our talk about confession, there's also a couple of side points I want to try and draw out. And they're both in verse 2 of our passage. Firstly, you may have noticed that the Israelites confessed not only their own sins, but the sins of their ancestors. This point resonates particularly, I think, with our current time in history. In the wake of George Floyd's death, we as a society are confronting racial injustice with roots that often goes back for hundreds of years. And I think the Israelite, Israelite example we've seen today suggests that we need to review our history with open eyes and open hearts. Yes, there's been a lot that's been done in British history to combat the slave trade, but equally, there has been a great deal of sin in our past and oppression. We need to be able to confront both, positive and negative, and to take ownership of them in order to move forward, forward and hopefully create a more fair and equal society. Now the other thing you might have noticed in verse 2 is that immediately before this bit about the ancestors, it talks about Israel removing themselves from foreigners. Now the point of this is not just a bit of casual racism. It flows from the fact that at that time in history, your nationality basically defined your, your religious beliefs. The Jews had ended up in exile because they'd failed to be faithful to God. And now at their return from exile, they were trying to do everything in their power to make sure they were not tempted again by foreign gods, foreign ways of worship. And so they wanted to distance themselves from foreigners. But this in itself might in fact be seen as an overstatement of what God required because it's clear throughout the Old Testament that God accepts everyone who turns to him. Race doesn't matter, loyalty, God, loyalty to God does. And so we see characters like Rahab the Canaanite and Ruth the Moabite who are both forerunners of Jesus and also Naaman the Syrian. All these people were called to respect the God of Israel and their stories are told as blessings in our scripture. But to wrap up this section, I want to return to that overarching theme of confession. And I'm going to leave you with another question. And that's this. If you had to confess to one person this week, who would it be?